Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the first of our uh, library lunchtime lectures for this semester. And I'm very happy uh, to be introducing shortly our speaker, uh, Dr. Kadirah Zeynep Siam. Um, she uh, studied for her bachelor's and MBA degrees in uh, Metu, and then she moved to England. Uh, I'm happy to say, uh, for a number of years. Uh, she studied at the University of Warwick, where she got an MA in Training and Human Resource Development, and then she did her PhD doctoral research in Human Resource Management at De Montfort University. She then worked in banking, uh, retailing, and NGO sectors, and in 2000, she joined Bill Kent University, the Faculty of Business Administration, and we're happy to say she's still here. Um, her research has been uh, awarded a number of uh, recognitions, papers, and so on, uh, and she works on uh, cross-national transfer of employment, uh, organizational policies and practices, and what we're going to be discussing today, uh, teamwork and also uh, gender, particularly in decision-making. Um, in my experience, the past 10 years or so, decade or so, it does seem that in education in particular, uh, for students, uh, there is a lot more group work going on, informally, but also, I think, formally as part of, of courses. So I think Zena will be touching both upon the implications for business, but also for education. And here in the library, as many of you may know, we have the multimedia room, the old music room upstairs, where we allow students to work in great and very noisy numbers uh, to help them get their high uh, uh, scores and so forth. Um, in England, we say many hands make like work, uh, so I'm hoping that will be the case uh, for us today. Um, just a couple of words before we start. If you could switch your cell phones off or put them into <coughs> silent mode so that we won't interrupt the speaker. And I'm hoping that we will have maybe 10, 15 minutes uh, uh, for some questions and discussion at the end. Okay, thank you. Zainab. I hope that works. Does it? Well, once again, welcome everyone. I'd like to first of all thank um, Dr. David Thornton for inviting me to the very first of this semester's uh, library lunchtime lecture series. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I also should um, thank uh, Mrs. Uh, Ülke Ögel and Burcu Tanrukulu, who are the people there who are the people behind the scenes because, as you might imagine, that requires a lot of intensive teamwork. And I must say the library has got one of the best performing teams, so thank you. Um, as um, David had indicated, um, group, group work or teamwork has become um, very widespread, uh, almost omnipresent everywhere uh, recently say a decade or two decades, whereas the research about teamwork had been going on for many decades. But we, we come to hear it more often nowadays in education as well as in, in research. So um, in our university, in our faculty, first of all, we take it almost for granted that teamwork is, is applied and done, as uh, some of our students here can acknowledge that we, we do it so um, as a matter of fact, if you like. And in our university, it is uh, very um, strongly emphasized, beginning with our rector himself, where um, you know, the university-wide programs uh, where teamwork is involved is getting more and more applied, like the recent History 200 course, for instance, where the students are expected to work in teams or the interdisciplinary courses that we have in the university, like a, a very recent one is a GE 440 at the uh, Faculty of Administrat Economic, Administrative and Social Sciences. So um, both in business and in education, we see a, a, a widespread use and application of teams. Um, so in this talk, I'd like to raise some awareness about this important issue called group or teamwork, which I'm going to touch upon. Uh, they might not mean the same things. And then um, I would like to emphasize a little bit why it is so important. 
um, a couple of words on how teams are formed and start to function. And um, lastly, strengths and especially challenges. Because although um, it is widespread, it is assumed that well, teamwork is easy. It is not. It is very difficult to get effective teams. Although it is almost taken for granted that teamwork is, is done and effectively expected, it is not. So we're going to touch upon some of these issues. Now, in layman's terms, everyday language, groups and teams, they mean the same thing. Um, and for this reason, I have chosen the topic accordingly, the wisdom of group work. Whereas academically, they don't mean the same. In fact, they are so different that there is a lot of research going on, still going on about it. And uh, some of the more, most recent ones you can see upstairs in the desk, actually, I, I put there. Um, they are even talking about pseudo teams versus real teams nowadays. Are teams real teams? Um, now, the difference between the two is uh, in group work, uh, academically speaking, it is mostly about sharing the responsibilities uh, in order to share information and everybody more or less work on their own and the combination is um, usually um, simple addition of these individual works whereas what we mean by teams is they share not only the tasks but also share goals common goals that everybody is thinking and working towards the same goal what we call the team spirit um, they interact not only for the job purposes, but socially as well. Therefore, there are different roles, social roles as well. Um, and their tasks are interdependent, meaning they have to work on each other's uh, outcomes as well as um, individual work so that uh, the outcome will be a, a more complete thing and more than the sim uh, simple addition of individual tasks. Um, and the last um, characteristic is that um, they have got boundaries, meaning who is the member of a team and who is not in the team are clearly defined. So people identify with their teams and they uh, work, they, they, they raise that team spirit accordingly, they trust each other, etc., which are really important issues for um, good performance, for uh, actual performance of the teams, which we are going to touch upon in a little while for um, when we're discussing the challenges as well. Now, um, this is another um, difference, uh, more um, visual, if you like, dif uh, showing differences between work groups and teams. And um, as you see, you know, the, the, the visual bit is also good, that the tasks are quite interdependent, they, they are linked to each other, it's more than just sharing information. Um, the skills, the teams are formed on purpose for certain outcomes and looking at the skills requirements of the people according to what roles they are going to play, what kind of knowledge and background in terms of experience they should have. Therefore, in work teams, in teams, they are complementary, they are chosen according to the requirements. The two things here, which are not in the definition, are quite important. The fir uh, first one, accountability, I'd like to say. Perhaps it's a less known uh, concept. Just for clarification, in Turkish it means hesap verebilirlik, meaning if the things go not, do not go as planned in the team work and the outcome, individual members are accountable for the negative outcome as well as as a team. So it is not like I have done my job but the others haven't done so that's the reason is not acceptable in teamwork and that's a differentiation, a, a characteristic that differentiates between groups and teams. Synergy, as David was saying at the beginning in English, um, we, we've got a comparable saying in Turkish, you know, bir elin nesi var? So synergy can be simply defined as that. I cannot um, quote the English version, David, exactly, I'm afraid. What was it? Many hands make light, make light work. Okay, many hands make light work. Quite similar. Now, as I said at the beginning at the, in the definition, um, that's, that's one of the major differences. 
individual team members selected on purpose they come together and after a while they build up that trust confidence in each other in each other's um, um, abilities skills experience etc and the tasks are interdependent and at the end they work such that the outcome is more than the sim a simple summation like just hands single hands do not produce any noise or music but when they come together they can produce that so that we call in synergy which is not existent in groups now having clarified that um, a couple of words perhaps why on why group work or teamwork have become popular now um, just to clarify again for the purposes of this seminar I use team or group interchangeably meaning the same thing because we used group work in the title so um, um, in, in business especially teamwork teams are everywhere and we're going to talk about the more contemporary challenges of teamwork but um, the major reasons main reasons are teams if functioning effectively according to expectations they outperform individuals of course that depends on what kind of tasks in hand so teamwork is not a simple solution for everything you have to take other uh, things into consideration like what kind of tasks we got how the team is uh, formed etc but usually ideally teams uh, indiv teams outperform individuals they do better than individual work uh, because perhaps they use employee talents better what does that mean when you're in team uh, because you need to perform different uh, tasks because you're not given only one responsibility but a couple of responsibilities and because when you come together you create that synergy you know you can uh, use your various skills more effectively like it's not like if, if you think about a production team for instance in, in, in an assembly line where the cars are produced uh, normally if it's not a team everybody is doing one single job day in day out eight hours a day but now uh, starting with Toyota production systems they have turned this into work groups where uh, eight to twelve people are working on dif different stages of car production and they're not only doing one single thing there but they can use at least five different skills and each team member should be able to do at least three different tasks and when one or two or my team members are missing the other team members are and have to replace the jobs the task responsibilities therefore we can use employee talents much better and they are more flexible responsive to changes in the environment as I said you know, in the closed environment in the uh, companies when something goes wrong but also if things change in the outside environment when we want to do things very quickly and when we want to um, do things which require more than one person's skills and um, thinking abilities that's where we can use teams easily um, they facilitate employee involvement therefore they're an effective way to democratize an organization and increase motivation um, usually in organization hierarchy things may be from top to down and people in the lower levels might not be given a chance to speak up but if there's teamwork and especially if teams are empowered which we're going to talk at the end of this uh, presentation then they will make their own decisions they are managed they're going to manage their own things their own jobs and that gives them a say which we mean by involvement and democratization of the organization because their decisions will influence higher up in the hierarchy as well so um, perhaps the last word here should be about motivation which is especially important in education perhaps by putting our students together we hope that they are more motivated or they are going to be more motivated because they are going to be challenged and supported by um, uh, fellow students and they are going to learn from each other because I know A, you know B, she knows C and when we come together we can all together learn the alphabet perhaps so we are talking about uh, motivational issues here in the um, 
business environment that's a, that's the motivation comes from uh, more from democratization involvement etc but in education it is more about perhaps learning from each other support from each other and sometimes push from each other that you have to do this we're expecting as a team member that you should do that um, a couple of words about team development uh, team formation um, Teams, uh, team members, as I said, should be selected um, carefully. Teams should be formed formally, not haphazardly. Um, and um, tasks and responsibilities should be defined, uh, again, carefully. But when you do that, you form a team, you said you are the team. Uh, it doesn't mean that the team starts working, functioning effectively from num day number one or hour number one. It takes a while for teams to get functioning. And this is only one model that shows team uh, formation, de their development. But it's one of the um, classic models, it, 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 important ones. At the beginning, the stage one, what we call forming, <coughs> the key word here is confusion. Team members don't know what is this about, perhaps. They don't know each other. They don't know how we should get started. And there's a lot of confusion going on there. And no functioning yet. Next, storming, as you can see from the arrows, team members are getting to know each other. They're trying to set the norms and um, rules and dividing the jobs, but still not really, because there is a lot of conflict about who is going to do what and when, who is going to be the leader, um, what are the best ways that we can follow in this um, task, etc. Come to stage three, now we see a little bit of getting rid of the chaos, norming. As the name implies, this is when the team numbers have got to know each other, are now trusting each other perhaps, and they are setting down the rules, the ground rules, so that they can start actually working. Um, a word of warning, the, 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 the group, the team, has not started doing anything about the task yet. Performing at the fifth stage, a uh, fourth stage, I'm sorry, um, the, the, the group uh, is expected to actually to start function, do whatever it's expected to do. And um, for some teams, this stage might be shorter, temporary teams, for others it might be longer, but at the end teams are usually uh, disen um, disembedded, and a joining stage might be difficult for some teams because they have developed such a team identity. They have developed their identity so much closely related with the team that they find it very difficult to leave the team and that team is uh, disbanded. That stage we call a journey. Now we got a couple of problems with uh, that um, model because um, this shows the team development as a linear model. Teams do not develop as, uh, as such. You know, sometimes they might be norming and storming. They might be performing, still having some problems about storming. So it, they might go back and forth between these stages. So this doesn't show um, the actual performance uh, development uh, um, model. And the second thing is, this usually applies to um, more long-term teams. For temporary teams, which are usually more widespread nowadays, more rules, we've got a different team mo development model, which is called the punctuated equilibrium model. This applies a lot to our student project groups, perhaps. And um, for those of you from Turkish background, we got a good Turkish name for this, developed by a couple of my colleagues when we were doing a team teaching on teamwork. And the name we came up with is Yumurta Kapıya Dayandı Modeli. Because in these uh, groups, nothing is done until midpoint. The team is formed, and uh, just before the midpoint, like for our student groups, 14 weeks of projects, before seventh week, nothing is done. And usually, seventh week is the time when there is an assignment, like proposals presentation. 
And the last day, last night, until the morning, early uh, times of the morning, they work on it. And then he, the transition here shows that assignment, that requirement, that monitoring process that makes the team start to work. So there is a, a breaking point here. And in the second phase, again, you see there isn't much done just before the ending point approaches. So that's another uh, uh, model, especially for temporary teams, as I said. So this shows reality, but what can we do with that? As I said, it's up to the monitoring team leaders and managers, etc., that they put good checking points here, not waiting until the midpoint. And then <coughs> in the second phase as well, that there is close monitoring and perhaps most important of all that the team leaders and managers do something to develop that trust and working sense so that the urgency comes quite before the half point in the team's life and um, uh, jobs. Now strengths, I'm going to talk a little bit about strengths and then uh, problems. Um, now here um, because of, um, again, ideally speaking, because team members are chosen carefully, um, there should be more complete information. Let's give the example of here um, um, product development teams in business. That a new product is going to be developed or there, is an improvement, there needs to be an improvement on a specific product. Now, that product team should normally consist uh, of people from the production uh, area, from marketing area, from finance area, and perhaps also from the sales area, because they all know something different about a new product. Marketing people know perhaps the needs of the consumers, but production people know how this product can be or whether or not it can be produced. Finance people need to know how much money is needed in order to start production of this new product, etc., etc. So we've got more complete information if we form the uh, teams uh, carefully. Um, diversity of views are going to be increased because everybody has got a different background and they bring those backgrounds and their experiences together. So I approach it from the point of view of marketing, other, the other, my colleague approaches from the finance point of view. Uh, therefore, ideally again, if everybody talks, if everybody contributes, uh, the quality of decisions would be higher, that we would find the best synergy, remember synergy, and then uh, because everybody would have contributed, the acceptance of that decision would be higher by everyone involved in the uh, team. If you think of the organization as a combination of teams, then the, um, that acceptance would be higher for all organizations. Uh, given all of these, we assume that there will be higher level of commitment in teams, not only for student uh, teams, but also for uh, business teams, because people will be able to get more involved, because they'll be able to use their skills, because they'll be challenged all the time, etc., and we, that we uh, assume is going to increase motivation. And that's gives us a poten higher potential for creativity and quality. Potential here is italicized on purpose, which I'm going to talk in a minute. Now, challenges. As I said at the beginning, it's not easy for teamwork to work effectively. Now, the challenges here are, that it can be more time consuming because you need time for team formation, people to get to know each other, trust, etc and therefore it can be inefficient. So if you need something to be done in crisis situations, very decision making, for instance, then you don't make the team decisions. Um, there is amplified opportunity to slack, which we call social loafing. Um, I'm going to say more about uh, this and group thing, which we define as the pressure to conform to group's decisions, which might be led by uh, a couple of people. Um, and <coughs> For performance evaluations, it might be very ambiguous because who does what, role clarity is not easy. Um, oops, sorry. Social loafing, um, there is a well-known um, 
e experiment done in 1920s by a German psychologist called Ringelmann. And the, the simple thing he used was role playing, tag of war play. And he started with one person on each and uh, measured the uh, uh, effort put into, and it was one person, one person equivalent of um, uh, effort. Two people, it was two people effort equivalent. Three people, it dropped down to two and a half. Eight people on each side, it dropped down to less than four. Social loafing. Therefore, size is important. Size does matter. We have to take um, the task and how many people we need into consideration. Group thing is uh, the norm, the pressure for people, uh, for individual team members to come to a uh, consensus to the idea led by one or few people. A classical example is uh, by, uh, in a film which some of you might know, 12 Angry Men, black and white, 1950s, Henry Ford, I suppose. This is about a young black man killing his uh, father, accused of killing his father. And 11 people argue that he's done it. One person says, I'm not sure. He doesn't say he, did, he didn't do it. He says, I'm not sure. If that person cannot feel the security, uh, the relaxed environment, the, com uh, the comfort to say that, they would have decided, because perhaps all the other people have conformed, felt the pressure to conform because it's a m great majority. And in the end, in the film, it is found out that actually he is not guilty. So this can happen a lot and usually it can happen because the team develops that team identity, uh, a grandiose identity that we have done such good things and we are a big team and uh, um, we cannot be beaten kind of uh, feeling that, and the majority pressure as well, and it might lead to uh, disasters. Like in the example of the uh, spacecraft, um, which have um, exploded, what's the name, I can't, Challenger, the Challenger disaster. It was uh, argued, emphasized by uh, one or two young engineers that there was a O-ring seal problem in the spacecraft because of the weather changes, drastic weather changes in the desert where these spacecrafts are um, um, sent to the space. But because NASA has got these um, uh, teams, large teams, which have got their good identity and you know, developed that belief that they are not unbeatable, nobody listened to them and, and they said, no, we cannot say that, shut up, there's no problem, we're going to do this. Because there have been a couple of um, cancellations of the spacecraft sending to the space, and then they sent it, and it was a disaster, as you know, eight astronauts have died in it. Um, uh, can, it can it be um, got rid of? Yes, you have to have people uh, who are the devil's advocates, who can talk against, uh, there has to be an environment where there's friendly conflict resolutions, etc. Because I don't have much time, I'm just rushing it here. This, <coughs> um, th as I said at the beginning, the team's effectiveness is very, very, very important and it's not easy to get. And this is a model that talks about the design, the composition, and the processes which make a team um, effective. Now, I have talked about many of these, but um, nowadays the teams are changing and there are more contemporary challenges in the environment. Uh, one of them is about, remember at the beginning I said the teams have got boundaries. Everybody knows who is the member, who is not the member. Nowadays teams are uh, used so much, there are so many temporary teams and sometimes they are formed so haphazardly um, that teams, uh, members are changing very quickly. The teams are disbanded, some members come in the middle, some leave, etc. And that creates a lot of problems about, of course, building that trust, getting to know each other and effectively the team formation and actual performance. Um, flash teams are used more and more for disasters, for instance. Flash team means teams which are brought together in a, in a quick way for solving crisis problems like 
you know, disaster uh, rescue teams or airline cockpit crews, etc. Um, and they don't have time to get to know each other to build up that trust, etc. Now, um, these are more... <coughs> and we've got simultaneous memberships in multiple teams. These create um, um, challenges as well as uh, positive outcomes for us, of course. Um, the positive outcomes are knowledge and experiences are more easily transferred from team to team. And um, it gives more uh, flexibility to respond to the changes in the environment. But um, team performances, getting to the performance levels, are becoming more difficult nowadays. And it increases the workload and problem of our time allocation. Uh, technology and distance virtual teams, um, especially for multinational corporations or international projects nowadays, we are using people geographically and culturally dispersed, of course, um, using technology-based communications and collaborations. And technology is even replacing team members, like in the case of robots or avatars or decision-making uh, systems, databases, etc., which are all challenging us because, um, uh, for instance, Big Brother Syndrome. By using technology, team leaders or managers can easily monitor now man, um, the team members or um, it creates information and workload, uh, work overload because, you know, we can be accessed all the time via our iPhones and iPads and, you know, we are expected to respond to every 24-7 to everything required by the teams. Um, some generations do not like technology-based communication, others just want to communicate all the time on the technology. And um, uh, cultural differences as well there. And robots and avatars are very difficult for some of us to accept as team members. Last, empowerment and delayering. That means um, that's a long, long-term uh, history. It has a long-term history about teams, that teams should be self-managed, that they should make their decisions, that uh, authority should be um, from top to down regarded to the teams. But nowadays this has been so widespread, especially because of downsizing and delaying, meaning getting rid of the middle level management usually, which creates of course additional problems um, um, like, um, which is in the next slide, I'm sorry. Um, that basically employees are asked to do more, but they don't get anything in, in terms of benefits additionally. They are just doing more and more, which of course does not create any motivation. Basically, team empowerment is supposed to create motivation because we are the teams, we manage our own teams, and we are committed to that, etc. as I said at the beginning. But if people are not giving anything additional, and if they have to do that, they are not motivated. In fact, they are demotivated. That's why we call it dark side of empowerment. I'm sorry I had to rush the last bit a little bit, but I have already taken more time probably. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let me quickly thank uh, Zeynep for what was an extremely interesting and very informative <coughs> discussion of the kind of theory of teamwork and the development of the changes that are are still ongoing. I would just like to add that at the moment, I don't think I want to replace any of the librarians on our team with robots or whatever. <laughs> what you in the team as it is. Okay, we have just over five minutes. We've got time for a few questions. I'm sure someone has got something to ask Dr. Simon. No, my question is how can I get a copy of your slides? Yes. I didn't read that. <laughs> Um, no problem, I can... Well, that's just if you wish to say... I mean, we, we do put these lectures online. Um, we have considered whether to actually but upload the uh, slideshows as well, but we haven't done that. But that's something that we could, we could be doing. Easily, no problem for me. Or if you could just send me an email, I would happily send you the um, slides. No problem. What's the difference between a uh, team and a committee? Ah, good question. <laughs> Committees um, in the business life, they, there's a big debate going on about that still, whether they are teams or groups. Um, as the definitions go, ideally they can be teams, but usually uh, they work like the 
they can be teams, but they usually do work like groups because um, jobs are tasks are usually just divided and everybody works on their own and they come together very not very often if they ever come together and share the ideas, etc. But ideally, depending on for what kind of a committee it is, of course, uh, for instance, um, change management committees, if the organization is going through a big change because of, say, a merger, for instance, um, they should be there to do a really good synergistic work. Um, but committees are formed so um, easily and haphazardly nowadays, you know, you can form a committee for anything and it might easily be group work, I'm afraid. Usually yeah. You, you began by distinguishing between the groups and teams mm -hmm. and then you gave us some very nice information about teams, particularly in business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would you apply any of the latter part of your lecture to groups in, in education, the kind of groups that we use in our classes or that are used in schools? Mm. Um, the would, would you be able to apply the, what you say about teamwork Ever, to yeah. groups in classes? Huh. Yeah, actually we do. So to long term group work, yes, maybe a project, maybe something like that, but to ordinary group work in classes, how does it apply? Um, when you say in classes, actually during the lectures. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the small group discussions we do, for instance, or case discussions I apply in my um, teaching quite um, regularly, if you like. And there I um, first formed group, uh, groups haphazardly, you know, people just sitting next to each other. But after a while, when I get to know the students, and especially they've got a long-term project, they get to know each other as well. I ask them to sit together accordingly, and where they can use their different um, skills and backgrounds, because in the project work, I, I ask them to be at least, for instance, gender uh, diversity to have in the group. And if I have... Um, um, uh, not a math course, but an elective course where there are people, students from different uh, educational um, faculties, that there is that kind of diversity. And when they do that discussion in class together, you easily see that by raising their voices and come up with their different ideas, they actually bring, um, you know, a diversity of views, a more accepted decision making, etc., etc. So it's it's a bit more difficult, of course, when you don't know the people, how to select, how to form the group. But once you get to know them, it can be easily applied, yeah, so if that answers. Exactly. Actually, that's what we, we always want. We don't want groups, we want teams. We want our groups to work as teams, because that's what creates synergy. Otherwise, you know, you see term papers, as I'm sure you have all seen, where the different parts of the paper are in different fonts, <laughs> different uh, sentence, uh, paragraph spacing, and you know you just see that they are cut and paste, even not um, controlled, checked whether or not they do say the same thing, etc. That's what group work creates. But if it is teamwork, they come together and they talk about what they have found, and you know it creates such an energy, such a synergy that the outcome is radically different. That's what we expect, of course. <laughs> Can we think about a hypothetical situation? In a hypothetical university, there's a hypothetical administrator <laughs> who has to get people working in what are groups, mm. but he or she wants them to form teams. Mm -hmm. They're formed, let's say, for three months or four months on and given an important task. Mm -hmm. But people have different agendas. They they're not all academics, they come from very different setups. Some are students, some are graduates, some mm. are alumni, some are this, some are that, and some are faculty members, mm -hmm. some are staff members. How do we get them motivated? How do we get them working as a team? <laughs> Difficult question, John. Uh, it's very hypothetical. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that. That depends a great deal on the team leader, I must say, <coughs> and the task identity. Maybe that would be better. Hmm. Um, here, task significance, that's what I meant. If the leader can um, 
ingrained that um, uh, thought, that um, feeling that what we are doing is, is very important, it is very significant, and we of all the people are the ones who can make a difference in doing this. Let's do that. Then people can feel that they're going to do something um, which would mean something to other people, and that might motivate them. Um, another way of uh, motivating them is about raising that identity with, um, with the team, but it's a, it's a great challenge because as you said, and as, as I was trying to say rashly at the end, that because we are members of multi-teams, so many that it creates a lot of problem about time allocation, how much to allocate to which team, and how much effort to allocate to which team, and that of course um, depends on how we are going to be evaluated. If that teamwork is going to be evaluated for my performance at the end of the year, etc., then I know that what I do is going to make a difference for me as well. Because people ask that question, what is it in there for me? So if the leader can uh, transfer that um, information as well, communicate that information as well, that is also motivating. Perhaps it's also important how much autonomy the team has got. If, as I was saying, empowerment, if the team makes the decisions and if, that, if those decisions are going to be taken into consideration, that's another challenge. Sometimes some organizations form so many teams, like committees, they let them you know, decide and do a lot of things, then the outcome is here, but nothing is done about that outcome. Of course, that's a big demotivator. The next time they won't do anything about it because you spend all that time, all that effort, and nothing happens at the end. Of course, you have to communicate that as well, that you know, you've got autonomy and it will make a difference. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to be in the place of that hypothetical leader, I'm afraid. <laughs> Not nowadays. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's 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 a big a big debate and a big problem um, in business as well because, as I said, so many teams, temporary teams, especially for service companies like consulting companies, for instance, where teams are formed. Many teams are formed according to different needs of. Um, customers, clients. We've got the same thing for student teams because there is social loafing, slacking, and uh, the roles are not clear, who does what, and especially the monitoring people, in this case the teachers, instructors, in business the managers, um, if they don't have the necessary tools in order to um, continuously monitor and um, get peer evaluations, not only their evaluations, but peer evaluations, um, and continuous, is, is I have to emphasize it, not once or twice, but throughout the life of the team, then it might be easier to understand who has contributed how much, and that should be made at the beginning clear that the continuous monitoring and peer evaluations are going to be reflected in the end performance evaluation as well. So it's not only going to be the leader who is going to do that, but the others will be involved in that evaluation. But everything should be very clear from the you know, day one, number one, and then it should be applied as such. Then it might be a bit easier. Still, it's not very easy. I get that. But it might not be easy for if you do it individually as well, because it's never certain who has done the job. You know, somebody else might have done it anyway. Here we've got more probability of social loafing, slacking, but there are certain tools, and if you make use of that, those tools, then it might be easier. Okay, um, we've got to finish there. People have classes to go to. Um, before I thank uh, Zainab again, I'd like to well, I'd like to say one very quick thing, which is uh, over the past year we've been collaborating here at the library with the university administration to uh, house a, a teaching centre 
uh, which uh, we actually have the rooms ready. We need, I think, the admin needs to, to uh, organise the uh, uh, the membership of that. But uh, thank you. Uh, today was very stimulating for me as a as, as a teacher as well as the library director, uh, talking about the theory of many aspects of of how to, to to get students to work together more effectively. Margaret's question and so on, very important there. So I'm hoping that these things and others may be uh, discussed in this building and elsewhere uh, in the future. Um, let me just have a quick advertisement. In exactly three weeks' time, on uh, Thursday the 5th of April, we will have the next library lecture. Dr. Thomas Turmen, the president of the International Children's Centre, will be speaking on early enforced marriages and child brides in Turkey. Quite a controversial but important subject. And in two weeks from now, we shall have the uh, Library Week. We'll have many activities there, which you'll hear about uh, through our webpage and email announcements. Okay, please put your hands together and make a noise. And say a I learned a lot from that, all sorts of things there in my